This is Floss Weekly. I'm Doc Searles. This week's Simon Phipps and I talk with Seth Fry of University of California at Davis. He's a professor there, sociologist, studier of all things, all interesting things, I think, about community and open source, democracy, how it all works, governance, how it's never quite done. And there's so much to study. Really interesting stuff. Great dialogue between him and Simon, especially because Simon's involved in that kind of thing. It's a really good show. And that is coming up next. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Floss Weekly, episode 723, recorded Wednesday, March 15th, 2023. Freedom to Fork. This episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Collide. That's Collide with a K. Collide is a device trust solution that ensures that if a device isn't secure, it can't access your apps. It's zero trust for Okta. Visit collide.com slash floss and book a demo today. Hello again, everybody, everywhere. I am Doc Searles, and I am joined this week by Simon Phipps himself in uh, yet another place in his house or lair or abode or location in Southampton. In yes, up, the up UK. above ground again, up in the, uh, right. the, ups, <laughs> the, the, the upstairs office. Don't let... Don't let the altitude get to you. <laughs> you're, yeah, are, I'm fairly cut you're only maybe. four. Yeah. You're only four hours ahead of me now. So, so I've been. Yeah, it's, we, it's like the middle of the afternoon, all because you're having your your daylight savings over there. I, <laughs> yeah, you know, right. I I hope you can save daylight. I trust that you're going to be able to do it. <laughs> yeah, well, we we have some here. It's been. I'm in the middle of Indiana. Indiana as far west as you could get, and still be in the Eastern time zone. So when I talk to people in Boston or New York, it's dark there while it's still light here. Um, it's weird. But anyway, there it is. So so our, our, our guest today is Seth, Seth Fry of uh, UC Davis and much else. Have you read or checked out any of his stuff? Uh, absolutely nothing. Um, oh, really? I, uh, yeah, yeah, really? absolutely get a, nothing. Get a crash course. Oh, man. Yeah, yeah. So I, I had a look at I, I, I cl- I'm I clicked used to around. you doing your homework. Uh, well, I, 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 well, I, I got your email yesterday saying I was on the show, which was a surprise. And um, oh. I, I, I clicked through some of the links and I've had a little look about what Seth is doing. And I'm still completely unfamiliar with, with what he's doing. I honestly never run into anything he's done before. So this is a great big well, learning experience. Now's, now's your chance to crash hard into it. Uh, um. <laughs> so, so with that, I'm just going to go ahead and, and, and give the brief incomplete uh, bio on Seth. He's a, a cognitive scientist, computational social scientist who studies human decision behavior in complex social environments, which you are expert in, in uh, Simon, um, with your open source background. Uh, his expertise is in computational approaches, approaches to self-governance and the cognitive science of strategic behavior. He's a good professor in communication at UC Davis in California uh, in the Computational Communication Lab, an affiliate in the Ostrom Workshop at Indiana University, which is where I intersect with him, also at D-Web Camp, um, where we got to hang out a bit. Uh, he's got a site in, in Fascination uh, on the Transmission of Wonder. Uh, there's got a blog that connects the mundane daily practice of science with experiences of wonder and humility that make it all worth doing. So welcome, Seth. <laughs> there you are. Where where are you, by the way? I I believe you're at an Airbnb. I heard or something like that. <laughs> no, I'm on the uh, I'm on uh, uh, I'm on university campus. I'm on. I suspected that because you seem to be surrounded by whiteboards and uh, <laughs> that's right, dirty ones, well used. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know they've they've got that look like you know it never comes off, but it kind of smudges around and and uh, I think cave walls were like that. <laughs> 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 so, so, so tell us uh, a, a bit about, you know, what, what you've been doing and, and I, I'm especially interested in the, uh, in the governance side, but just tell us, you give us the whole framework because you cover a lot of ground. Okay. And that's Great. why I wanted you on the show. 
Yeah, so um, so I've cared about um, self governance for a long time personally because I I live with a bunch of people. I, um, I lived in community for a long time. Um, uh, cooperative houses as small as uh, you know four people, as big as four hundred people, and there's amazing variety and diversity in how they all uh, succeed or fail at keeping the kitchen sink clean. Uh, and, and this is the fundamental problem of, you know, it's a microcosm of the biggest problems facing humanity. You know, that is uh, climate change and, and deforestation and overfishing and, and super bugs even. They all have the same logical structure. They're all examples of common pool resources. And Go ahead. Yeah, sorry. And so um, uh, you can imagine my delight to find out that there's, uh, you know, in the middle of doing this and uh, struggling with it during grad school, um, I uh, discovered that there's a science of it. Um, uh, there's a woman named Eleanor Ostrom, um, and she had developed really impressive uh, methodologies and performed very impressive studies um, uh, of common pool resource systems. And the key to it was um, she was able to get lots and lots and lots of them into one a book governing the commons and then lots and lots and lots of them into two other books um so you know uh, i'm trained uh, as a cognitive scientist so i get thousands of people in the room uh, uh if i want to understand humans so if i want to understand commons i, I shouldn't really do a, a case study which is what you normally do because it's hard to go to hundreds or thousands of communities um uh uh, but but she managed it and would compare hundreds and hundreds to extract general design principles of sustainable common pool resource management, sustainable self-governance, uh, effective empowering um, uh, leadership or structure or voting. Um, and uh, I've, uh, over the years, taken my career more and more in that direction, moving to online communities, comparing hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of online communities that self-govern in order to extend these insights into common pool uh, resource management and also serve the, the, the mission of a lot of these online communities, such as um, open source software projects. So I, I want to go back briefly to... Uh you're living in a house with people because um, I, I think the biggest divider of people is between those who leave dishes piled up in the sink and those who clean them up. I, I am a messy person, but I'm one of the ones who cleans them up. My wife is a very neat person and who I think at least some of the time believes that putting dishes in the sink uh, cleans them. <laughs> and, <laughs> I have a son as well, but, but I'm wondering about that. I mean, to, to, to what extent do those kind of things reveal something about people like an out of sight, out of mind sort of thing? Oh, you know, I, I don't need it to mean anything. We're really different. Um, and, uh, society is the process of us, despite being really different, managing to kind of get along together and whatever solution you can urge to, uh, in your household, um, uh, you know, uh, there, there's room for what, what, what we might call institutional diversity. I'm not too normative about things. Yeah. So, so how, have you looked at, uh, open source communities or any in particular, or can we speak of them in a more general sense? Cause that's where Simon um, comes in. He's been involved in lots of them. I've just observed them as a reporter. Right, right. Well, so I do have uh, this comparative angle. We'll actually be at uh, PyCon next month talking to communities that are transitioning from uh, benevolent dictatorship to uh, community management. Uh, but I'd say my, my deepest uh, studies have been of the Apache Software Foundation Incubator, which is a nice little clatch of uh, 300 projects that are transitioning their governance style from whatever they started up with, whatever got them off the ground, to uh, the Apache Software Foundation's kind of more standard formal umbrella. Um, and I have a project on GitHub projects as well. So Simon, <laughs> chatting in the back channel. <laughs> we were both we we're both reading a different screen there. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I, I I have questions, Seth. Um, so right. I, 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 I'm I'm quite fascinated. So I, I you know uh, I admitted at the beginning that I I've been speed reading your websites over the last <laughs> few hours. Um, so one one of the things that uh, concerns me about um the uh the 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 study of governance mechanisms is its constant reference to the tragedy of the commons uh, mm. because I, i've seen quite a lot of work that has suggested that uh, garrett harding's 
uh, original work is is actually deeply flawed. That basically he is um, a, a a person who uh, is rediscovering his initial suppositions rather than uncovering a truth, and that actually other elements of the uh, of the conduct of human nature mean that a tragedy of the commons is not inevitable in a self-governed community. Do you want to comment on the validity of tragedy of the commons before we go anywhere near open source? Uh, sure. Um, uh, you know, um, you can start a social system in one way and it can end up in lots of ways. And there's no doubt uh, that the tragedy of the commons is one way that you can end up um, uh, I, so I wouldn't agree that the, the concept of the tragedy of the commons is flawed. Certainly Garrett Hardin was flawed. Um, uh, but the tragedy of the commons is an outcome, <laughs> you know, uh, is it inevitable? Certainly not. And, you know, and, uh, and he, uh, argued that, it, uh, different institutional regimes that, you know, there's also centralized enforcement uh, and privatization, uh, which was sort of what he ended up advocating, which aligns very well with the whole 20th century narrative of, you know, freedom versus communism or whatever. Uh, and, and, and so he fits into like a broader uh, 20th century narrative and sets up the scene nicely for figures like Eleanor Ostrom, uh, who, uh, uh, who won the Nobel Prize in economics precisely for breaking that, that state versus market um, uh, dichotomy dichotomy or state versus tragedy uh, dichotomy um, by, by demonstrating that, yes, but just like you say, uh, people can talk, <laughs> come up with solutions, uh, uh, negotiate uh, uh, solutions to the tragedy of the commons that align with their own values, that exhibit um, you know, community values, that exhibit norms, care, mutual regard, um, uh, and also, you know, some extent, uh, leadership centralization. Uh, that in between those extremes of, you know, failure or the state, um, you have a whole bunch of stuff and, and everything she developed was to expose the U.S. language for talking about everything in the middle, uh, including uh, d democratic solutions. Right. Now, uh, when it comes to open source, uh, I've, I've been involved in, in uh, uh, it, both establishing and um, coaxing along a number of open source communities. And I have to tell you that I'm getting uh, much less persuaded by the, um, uh, the, the value of a, a purely democratic approach to community governance. Do you want to talk a little bit about what you found in uh, the long term from communities in, in open source? Or, or uh, I, you know, I don't know whether you've, whether you've looked at that or whether you've only been looking at the transition from uh, ad to, uh to more formal governance. What, what, what is the best way of preparing for the long-term future where nobody that's involved today is involved tomorrow? Um, I can, uh, before I get to longevity, I can actually um, maybe speak a little bit to this, you know, questioning the, the value of democracy. Um, you know, uh, 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 two audiences that are more accustomed to this kind of market state, market versus state dialogue. Um, I'm, you know, I'm a, I'm a big old uh, advocate for, uh, for democracy, big enthusiast um, and big practitioner. Uh, uh, living, living it uh, every day um, in little mundane ways. Uh, to uh, democracy advocates, I tend to be one of the loudest voices in favor of uh, leadership, <laughs> hierarchy, bureaucracy. Um, I, I, I think there's a lot to be said for institutional diversity, even uh, if it looks like a backstep sometimes. And you really see it in, in open source. Democracy's overkill for an early project just starting. So in the communities I'm involved in, we tend to be really big advocates for what you might call temporary benevolent dictatorship, uh, which is um, have one person drive their passion project until it's worth it to other people to put in uh, the extraordinary amount of work of self-governance. So uh, uh, democracy is a pain and uh, Americans, especially um, people who live in, in um, market societies, societies based around private property, our sharing muscles have atrophied. Our, our, our democracy engagement, um, mutual regard uh, muscles in many ways are atrophied. It takes a lot of practice to be effective uh, in democracy and for democracy to be worth the work. And I think it takes quite high stakes. I think 
um, you need to be managing something that's really, really meaningful to you for democracy to be worth the work. That's not to say there isn't a lot of room for participation, but I'm often impressed by how um, benevolent dictatorships or, or other structures um, can effectively integrate the needs and values of multiple stakeholders, which for me is a little more fundamental than democracy. Democracy is one way of executing integrating the needs of lots of kinds of people of all of your stakeholders and that and that's the kind of general design i'm interested in so uh you know i i don't think that the dichotomy is between um, uh, dictatorship versus democracy uh, I, i've observed that um generally speaking there needs to be a democracy amongst the people who are concretely contributing and uh, I think the thing that makes a difference in open source is that in the wider society, we've gone for global enfranchisement, whereas in open source, you you really should only be enfranchising the contributors, not also the uh, the the consumers of the work of the community. Would, would you agree with that? Or do you think that we should also be enfranchising end users who contribute nothing? Um, I... I think there's something we said in a, in a highly expert uh, community for, um, uh, you know, things that approach or aspire towards meritocracy um, uh, and, and have multiple levels of engagement. Um, I think, uh, you know, a direct democracy um, uh, to me is always most notable for its very dramatic failures. Um, uh, you know, I was always struck uh, living in, uh, uh, in Switzerland. I lived in Zurich for a brief uh, period. Um, uh, and, uh, yeah, it's famous for, um, you know, it's anti-mosque rules that, that result from, uh, from referenda, uh, California as well, uh, uh, living in California. Um, uh, it's, it's, uh, direct democracy, um, you know, it can be subject to, to, to mob rule. Um, I think it has its place. Um, and I think, uh, more importantly, uh, we should recognize that, you know, uh, elected representatives or our elites aren't that great at it either. You know, if politicians are making effective choices, it's because they have a staff, they're surrounded by a staff of experts. They have a library, the Library of Congress, for example. Um, uh, they do, they have to do their research. They have to learn about domain to make effective decisions in it. So it's really more about having the, the time and having the resources. If every citizen or if uh, the the more passive co contributors to your community had a, a cabinet of experts to access um in the process of making decisions and they had the motivation and the time uh, uh to to contribute those then i would trust them as much as any more invested uh, contributor so it's less about how much you've given to the code base it's more how much you're willing to give to the management of the project Right. I, and I think I'd agree with that. I think that contribution has many colors. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I'm very happy to uh, the, the idea of enfranchising the people who do the, uh, the, the, the run public events for the community or the people that create the documentation. My concern is more about enfranchising. Uh, and this is this comes from, you know, an experience of a community mm -hmm. where it has a very large uh, global community of end users. And a lot of people believe that that community of end users should have the deciding voice in what the open source project does. And, and I actually think that's that's wrong. Uh, I think that an open source. I'm, I'm not going to go as far as wrong. Is a, a collaboration of co-contributors. And when you're not a contributor, you probably shouldn't be getting a vote. Um. Where I'm going to, I'll go slightly different, which is that every governance design decision has upsides and downsides. Uh, and director, director of democracy is going to have clear upsides and clear downsides. We know them, at least that it's a, um, it's a known quantity. And it's, and, and I can see it, you know, the most utopian picture is going to be that that warts and all, um, is going to be a starting place, a uh, starting point to something worth value, which is um, a, a large community of people that you're providing these skills of self-governance to. Uh, now, that's a little idealistic, and I wouldn't fault anybody for uh, using a more closed circle, um, leaving at least key core uh, uh, um, community decisions to core contributors who have demonstrated their willingness to put the time into the project necessary to make good decisions. Um, but I'm, you know, I'm, I'm still hopeful uh, for uh, bad direct democracy as a pathway to a utopian good uh, direct democracy, which, you know, uh, that's where you get spillover effects into maintaining large scale democracies uh, like like the countries we live in. Um, 
uh, democracy is a muscle you have to practice every day. And there, there's no better way of gaining the skills uh, than uh, daily participation. So providing opportunities for that um, is both naive and um, the upside of naive, which is hopeful. Um, you know, way, the one way I like to put it is there's no better way to develop a really fine-tuned radar for abuse of power than to have had the experience of being able to abuse power yourself uh, in, in running the, the small things in your daily life, whether that's uh, the kitchen sink or the garden club or your OSS project. Right, right. So, you know, to, to, to round that thought out, my instinct as a community designer is to uh, enfranchise those who are qualified and to not enfranchise those who are not qualified. Do you think that's a, that's a fair approach? Should I be enfranchising uh, the uneducated and unqualified as well? <laughs> um, well, first, I would. Uh, it's not your instinct. I, I think your your it's your experience. Um, your instinct sounds like it, it, you know. Uh, maybe you started off as more of an advocate of direct democracy, and, and you saw the downside. You experienced the downsides of it. Um, I would be a little less binary. I think there are some types of decisions uh, or some types of pathways that make a lot of sense for including everybody. And 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 you, know, and, and you see it right. Um, uh, bug trackers, um, uh, issues on 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 GitHub. Uh, those are a pathway for everybody, uh, you know, even po sometimes participation in roadmaps uh, and user surveys. These are all ways of integrating the, the, the needs and they're less direct. Maybe they don't um, provide uh, the, the, the freedom or opportunity to vote. Um, uh, so I would be so I tend to think in terms of little steps. Um, there's really, really substantive decisions, and I would like to see those made uh, by people who have a track record of, of contributing meaningfully to substantive um, decisions. Uh, and so I'm, I'm in favor of a more continuous version of what you're describing, personally. Right. I, I, I have to say, we, I've got very bad experiences of voting in Bugzilla, where uh, every end user <laughs> in the world all votes for the impractical thing that they want implemented, but yeah. nobody can possibly yeah. afford to do. Um, uh, the, the the one difference, of course, between open source communities and public communities is that uh, if an open source community goes badly wrong, um, a group of people can simply fork, uh, mm -hmm. where, whereas that's generally frowned on in, in civil society. You know, uh, I, I'm not allowed to comment on politics on this show, yeah. but um, I could imagine a situation where there might be people in, in, in a country who want to fork, and I believe that's called an insurrection. Um, so... Um, <laughs> Uh, do you oh, think forking that, is that, a that, that, does sorry, does that ahead. difference really make a difference? You know, the the the, the freedom to fork. Absolutely, um, I think uh, uh, you can call it. Um, you know. Voting with your feet isn't really a credible mechanism in a lot of places. Voting with your feet um, is sort of the basis of economic applications to like municipal governance. When the when we do economics on cities, uh, this sort of uh, this basis of, of voting with your feet that doesn't really make a lot of sense because you can't just up and leave. It's not that easy. You have to change your life. Um, a move is one of the most stressful. Uh, 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 things that happens to people. Um, but in an online community, the fact that you can um, uh, vote with your feet with a click of a button, and you don't have just freedom to exit, but what you might call entrepreneurial exit, the freedom not just to leave for a competitor, but to leave for your own uh, version of, of this um, uh, system um, is really unique to the internet and adds a whole other dimension um, to design. Now, I, I think you can um, uh, react to that by <laughs> putting all uh, putting everything in exit as the solution to everything. I think that's a huge mistake. What I, what I think it, uh, is important to do is recognize it as a tool in the toolkit um, uh, and, and, and continue to use everything else. Um, uh, you know, you really see this in DAOs. Um, DAOs really went naively into direct democracy, and they see um, all the failures of that and more. Uh, um, the DAOs that I'm most impressed by are the ones that are using very old, you know, centuries or millennia old toolkits. They do politics. <laughs> they they um, uh, they talk. Um, they build community very intentionally out off the chain, outside of the software. Um, those are where you see high participation and more, more and less um, uh, high levels of, of being informed voters. Uh, of course, you know the problem with DAOs is they they uh, embrace the uh, the uh, a worship of the perfection of code, 
to the point where people discover that the bugs that have inevitably been written take all their money away. So <laughs> I, 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 I tended to view DAOs as, a, as a unfortunately naive in there. Uh, you know, they, they, they have a, a, dis, a dyspeptic view of humanity and, a, and they believe code is perfect. And I think they've probably got it wrong in both counts there. Um, I've, I've been fortunate to meet a lot of people who run a lot of DAOs and um, that's where they start. Uh, but you make enough, you know, $30 million mistakes, um, and you start to, um, lose your naivete really quick. And so, uh, I'm one thing that makes me hopeful about DAOs, um, is, uh, that they are thousands of little laboratories for uh, people to learn these lessons on their own, hopefully, um, you know, cheaply and sometimes very expensively. Well, I need to jump in here and, and I, there are a bunch of questions that are backed up on our back channel, um, uh, including from other co-hosts, <laughs> at least one other co-host who is eager to contribute. One of his questions already, uh, 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 Simon asked, but we'll get to those in a moment. But first, I have to let everybody know that this episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Collide. That's Collide with a K. Collide is a device trust solution that ensures unsecured devices can't access your apps. Collide has some big news. If you're an Okta user, Collide can get your entire fleet up to 100% compliance. Collide patches one of the major holes in zero trust architecture, device compliance. Think about it, your identity provider only lets known devices log into apps, but just because a device is known doesn't mean it's in a secure state. In fact, plenty of the devices in your fleet probably shouldn't be trusted. Maybe they're running on out of date OS versions, or maybe they've got unencrypted credentials lying around. If a device isn't compliant or isn't running the Collide agent, it can't access the organization's SaaS apps or other resources. The device user can't log into your company's cloud apps until they fix the problem on their end. It's that simple. For example, a device will be blocked if an employee doesn't have an up to date browser. Using end user remediation helps drive your fleet to 100% compliance without overpowering your IT team. Without Collide, IT teams have no way to solve these compliance issues or to stop insecure devices from logging in. With Collide, you can set and enforce compliance across your entire fleet, Mac, Windows, and Linux. Collide is unique in that it makes device compliance part of the authentication process. When a user logs on with Okta, Collide alerts them to compliance issues and prevents unsecured devices from logging in. It's a security you can feel good about because Collide puts transparency and respect for users at the center of their product. To sum it up, Collide's method means fewer support tickets, less frustration, and most importantly, 100% fleet compliance. Visit collide.com slash floss to learn more or book a demo. That's K-O-L-I-D-E dot com slash floss. Um, <laughs> I'm looking back up, up the, uh, the thing here. There's a, a just a great, great one liner direction of the code is very different from direction of the wiki and the wikis where the users often participate and the code is not, though maybe it's both. I don't know. Um, so I, I, th I think you've touched on that. Um, but another question, here's another one from, uh, yeah, I, can, I can touch a bit more, yeah, touch a bit more on that. Yeah, that's good. Um, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, feature kind of feature requests, feature voting are, are a great example. Um, uh, what do you vote for when you're voting on a feature? You're voting on what you want. Um, and what you're doing as a core contributor when you're voting on a feature is you're voting on what the code needs, what the community needs. And so, um, uh, users are, you know, it's a, the popularity contest is, is what I want. And that's your framing. Uh, if you frame it as what, forget what you want, what is best for the community? We have, here's our roadmap. Here's our mission. Here's what we're trying to accomplish in the world as a, you know, a, a, as a, as a code base, what's best for that. Um, now, uh, will that, does that magically solve everything? Do users suddenly stop being self-interested? No. Will you get more reflection and, and uh, uh, maybe if you even ask the question twice, what do you want? What's best for the code base? Uh, the, uh, or, uh, and, and, and this is what you get. So focusing on core contributors gives you that as a side focus, the people thinking of what's best for the project. Um, 
uh, you get it as a side effect. And there's other ways to get that. There's other ways to get people thinking about what's good for the project. So uh, this comes down to informing people, setting things up, and making it clear what they're voting on when they're voting. Um, you're participating in the project and the needs for the project. This isn't a user survey for us to find out what the users want. Uh, this is a, a decision-making mechanism for us to support this common, support this public good, support this project collectively. So um, I don't know how, how relevant this is, but I think it's important. Um, you know, I was a, for 24 years an editor for Linux Journal, and every time I talked to Linus or anybody talked to Linus, he'd always say, um, when people brought up user issues, he'd say, that's user space, I'm kernel space. And there's this very sharp distinction in Linux kernel development between kernel space and user space. And kernel developers would tell me, we only care about what's good for the kernel and what the kernel is good for. And it's very, very broad. Yet we know that obviously the needs of large corporate customers, large corporate users, the, the, the entities that are one step that are between the kernel developers and the actual users of, of the kernel in whatever application it might be. And now with Linux, it's everything pretty much. Um, but how, how that influence works and how you keep that influence, especially big corporate influence from corrupting, as it were, the kernel itself. And I'm, you may not have a direct answer for that, but it's an interesting one because there are these layers that are involved between the creators of the code and the actual users of code. Yeah, it's nice to bring in corporate because it breaks these dichotomies, um, you know, core contributors versus user, and it really gets you in this picture of, of types or styles. There's very different types or styles of stakeholder. They all have really different needs and wants and resources. Um, and, you know, an ideal design has made all the mistakes um, and then taking into account those potential mistakes uh, gives, you know, corporate stakeholders this extra power, but denies them this, that extra power and gives users this extra power, but denies them that extra power and gives core contributors um, maybe a bigger slice of the pie, but places checks on them. You know, this is your um, uh, um, uh, hindsight is 2020 kind of governance design where you really have a clear sense of every potential um, you know play at the table um, and what they're going to try to get away with and you can design for that. Um, uh, Linux, uh, I'm involved in a large comparative study of several open source foundations. There's about over a hundred in the world um, and you can really see in the variety in their designs how they've each uh, come uh, to the problem of inordinate corporate influence. You see a very different um, uh, approach at Linux Foundation, which is a little bit pay to play, um, versus Apache Software Foundation, which has very strict rules um, about um, uh, how corporate um, actors, corporate sponsors, and and the um, the volunteers that they pay to contribute, um, what kind of role they can play uh, in a project. And you know, even in Apache, you see inordinate uh, corporate influence, um, but it's tempered. I think in intelligent ways, in ways that reflect a lot of foresight, in ways that reflect a, a, a lot of care for the fundamental values. Right. Now, I've looked quite, looked quite a lot of both of those. Um, one thing I, I, I think I have to point out for listeners is that Linux Foundation and Apache Foundation are very different organizationally uh, because uh, the Linux Foundation is a trade association that's acting on in the interests of the members who are paying to support it, whereas the Apache Software Foundation is a, uh, a public charity that is there to serve the general public and consequently is not swayed by the money of any contributors. Uh, and as I look across open source foundations, I generally see there are many more public charities than there are trade associations, but there is a lot more publicity for the trade associations. So a lot more people have heard of Linux Foundation than have heard, for example, of the Python Software Foundation or the Document Foundation. Um, and so I, I do think it's very important to make that distinction between just because they use the word foundation at the end of their name, it doesn't mean that they're a charity in any way. Uh, mm -hmm. They might well just be another Delaware corporation. Uh, like, for example, the Rocky Linux Foundation is just a B Corp. It's not actually a, a charity of, of any kind. Uh, so I think you, it's very important to make that distinction and not let people hide behind that word foundation. Um, do, do you think that we should emphasize that more as we're talking about uh, governance so that people are able to understand that the governance that's serving the stakeholders varies between trade associations and public charities? 
Well, you're talking to a person interested in institutional diversity, so of course, you know, <laughs> the world should know. Um, uh, I think I am uh, on some level comfortable treating them as apples to apples in terms of what support are they providing to their specific open source projects um, that are, you know, under their umbrella. Uh, um, and if they're, you know, if they're both, you know, more or less devoted to providing resources and supporting that code and making it healthy in the long term, then I'm comfortable treating them on the same level at the same time. Totally different organizational forms, totally different governance structure, totally different stakeholders and balance among those stakeholders. Um, and so I like that we have um, a, a large ecosystem, again, hundreds of, of umbrella organizations that uh, call them foundations or not, that support open large numbers of open source projects and help them solve that collective action problem. And I like that open source project developers have a lot of choice in, in which way they go. I think it's okay that, um, uh, you know, uh, corporate needs are specific and it's okay for a large number of companies to work together to develop open source code. Now, it's a little unfortunate perhaps that the venue they found to do that uh, involved capture <laughs> to some extent of Linux and its development. Um, but, uh, you know, there's there's other places to go if, if you want to be involved in development and want an umbrella organization that uh, acts consistently with your values. Uh, so now you've you've studied uh, Apache, um, and uh, you know that's Apache is a, a fascinating software foundation. It was in many ways the first uh, fiduciary host for open source projects, and uh, we can see a lot of the effects of maturity in there. Um, I, I posit that uh, the bigger the number of rules is, the more games there are that are playable uh, on a foundation. Do you think that's true? Mm -hmm. Or do you think that uh, organizations, as they solve their problems, gradually reach a position of stability in their governance? Um, that is a fundamental question of political science. <laughs> that is um, um, thousands of years old, um, uh, hard to answer empirically. And a really fun thing for me about studying open source projects is I don't just serve um, open source software, I serve political theory. Uh, there's a chance you don't have 100 Earths and you need 100 Earths to answer the basic questions of governance. Um, but you do have a hundred or a thousand or tens of thousands of open source projects, subreddit discussion forums are an amazing place to study um, uh, governance design uh, at small scale. One of my favorite cases, and actually, honestly, one of the cases I'm most proud of is a large comparative study of self-hosted Minecraft servers. Um, kids de uh, designing governance systems essentially a la carte um, in line with their own folk theory of collective action to solve the very important um, common pool resource and public good uh, problems involved in running a game server and playing with your friends. Right. So, so uh, I, 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 so I've posited that uh, any stable system of rules creates uh, a gaming space proportional to the number of rules and the length of time they've been in operation. Um, do you think that it is viable to have? Um, subjective rules in an organization so that um, you can uh, defer to your leadership and let them use the I know it when I see it approach? Or do you think it's better for uh, open source communities in particular that tend to have a lot of um, uh, very detail focused individuals in them? Do you think it's better to have concrete rules that people can objectively and mechanically apply? Um, you're going to tend to be really disappointed at, at, at my willingness to take a strong stand on how things should be. Um, uh, there's clear failures, uh, failure modes. So there's clear potential failure modes to giving your leadership a lot of discretion, um, and there's clear benefits to that. And vice and and the other and and same for 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 community management. So what I think is important is just be aware of what's going to go wrong, what's going to go right when you err in this versus that direction. What's most exciting to me um, uh, for open source and for a lot of online communities um, is less tell them how to run and more design the software, design tools that let communities continually ex experiment with their own governance. Um, that, hey, let's try um, uh, benevolent dictatorship for a week. Let's try a uh, corporate overlord for a week. Let's try um, total uh, anarchist um, duocratic um, governance uh, for uh, a week's ridiculous, um, for several months, for this year, for this next roadmap, for, the, for this next product release. Um, uh, 
And encouraging a culture of learning helps communities nav uh, learn those downsides and navigate and iterate so that you don't, um, so that the price of learning your really important lesson about um, the value of, of um, user input um, doesn't come at the cost of being entrenched in a system that you stop respecting because it's uh, uh, learned that failure so dramatically. So encouraging uh, change um, and dynamism and providing tools that make it possible for entire communities to go at this meta level, uh, play with how they run, I think is really the way forward. Now, uh, but again, you're getting my values. I, I care about open source. I think open source is really important for the world. It's not my leverage point, honestly. It's not, my, it's not where I'm investing myself to change the world. Um, I, I love serving it and I love working with people who are driven by values. My leverage point is providing experiential education in self-governance to lots and lots of people. Open source is amazing for that and a lot of other online communities are as well. And so by encouraging experimentation, we not only provide a, a probably rocky pathway towards better governance systems that are fit to each project. We also provide the education in sharing um, that's useful in every aspect of our lives and that transfers beyond the specific project we, we cut our teeth on. Uh, so the reason that I, you know, I, 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 I keep on in, trying to get um, uh, uh, Hard answers. answers is is because I've actually got a design. So I'm in, involved in designing the governance for a community at the mm -hmm. moment, and and I'm not going to have the luxury of putting in place a system where we can change the governance every two months yeah. uh, right. based on our experience right. of what didn't work. Uh, and yeah, so I really right. do need to be able to look at a, a community and um, make some you know concrete uh, uh, determinations. And so I, you know the community that I'm helping design here, I've given them some concrete. Uh, guidance. I've expressed my skepticism about direct democracy. Uh, mm -hmm. I have expressed my skepticism about pay to play. And um, we've put in place um, some public charity governance. Uh, but, I, I, you know, my experiences with Apache show that there are plenty of ways that a, a determined individual can take all of the good intent that we've put into our governance and use it against us. And, and I'm really looking to work out, you know, what can I do about that? What can I do about that in advance? Um, and you're absolutely right. The way you're designing a governance system depends a lot on if you can assume good faith um, uh, interest in the common cause or not. And so the, the more open your boundaries are, the less you can assume that... Um, uh, uh, that everyone is acting in good faith and the, and the more uh, valid it becomes to assume that out of your thousands of contributors, um, there's going to be a handful who um, are highly motivated to pursue their own interests and game the system toward their own ends. And the more you can close the boundaries uh, or create boundaries um, that, that filter uh, very intentionally, maybe very slowly for people who have evidence of caring about the needs of the community and putting the needs of the community above their own needs, then you can design uh, an increasingly utopian or uh, assume good faith uh, type of governance system. Uh, the answer the answer um, is both, you know, uh, design, this is uh, acknowledging the existence of different stakeholders with different levels of commitment. So for the random person coming off the street, I really would give um, some levers um, because that creates a path for them to demonstrate that good faith that build uh, that gets them into um, uh, uh, maybe the core contributor group. Uh, you know, open source softwares they tend to confound the core contributors with the people um, who have the who are most likely to have the project interest in mind. And those you know are probably like mostly overlapping, but not completely overlapping uh, 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 in a Venn diagram. Uh, so however you want to represent or filter for those people, some pathway where you can create a smaller set of rules for this proven set of people um, where you can assume good faith and you can provide a lot of power, authority, uh, and, uh, and, and freedom uh, because you uh, are able to assume that these people are going to put their interests first. There's no way of enforcing putting in community interests first. And you, I think it is valuable. I think you're onto something uh, in protecting against that. But I think you can also be a little bit less absolutist. Um, yeah, yes, you've been burned. You know, yes, you've seen things go really bad. Um, there's ways to protect against that without, um, um, without uh, you know, c cutting users out. Right. So the, the, uh, another question that comes out of all this, 
you know, there's you, th one of your threats is your own people and uh, people for whom assume good faith doesn't apply. Uh, mm -hmm. The other category that I've seen happening in other uh, organizational styles is where you employ a staff and gradually you get uh, Purnell's law uh, cutting in and the organization begins to transform into one that's run for the benefit of its staff rather than for uh, its community. Uh, uh, do you have any hints for how to prevent that from happening? Um, yeah, um, there's lots of kinds of stakeholders. Um, yeah, I've definitely seen it. It is a threat. I don't, let's see. I haven't studied it specifically. I tend to uh, study volunteer run communities. Um, uh, but what can, but I can add, you know, um, it's analogous to the way that you protect against capture of any entrenched, entrenched interests. Um, but really the most fundamental thing you can do is hire onto staff people who care about community. Um, because there is going to be some level in the most successful systems, there's going to be some level of, um, norm driven rather than rule driven protection uh um of of community values um so you know to some extent you're really powerful people just have to internalize the importance of in uh, hearing lots of stakeholders and remembering who they serve so uh at the risk of um uh, uh spooking you and um and, and cursing a community are there any communities that you look to that have got their governance pretty much perfect? Oh, um, um, no one doesn't complain about their governance. Um, I think governance <laughs> is just something you complain about. <laughs> um, and and, and it, it illustrates the point, right, that there's no right system, that, that you're always making decisions that are going to have upsides and downsides. Um, and people just tend to be more in touch with the downsides um, because that's the cause of the problems they have to spend, you know, um, uh, too much time dealing with. Um, uh, but what, when I really admire a system, um, it's because they've, um, actually, you know, there's no, there's no shortcuts, but one, um, shortcut, um, hire a community manager, um, have someone who's doing project management for, um, creating, creating a population that's, um, ready for, uh, that's up for democracy um, and that's trained for democracy that's trained for participation. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm less interested in uh, how do we create the, the governance system that's right for this population. And, I, and I'm kind of interested in how do we create the population that's right for this governance system, making ourselves worthy um, of, of the systems that we're serving uh, and community managers do that. Um, they create a pathway for finding people, for building excitement and enthusiasm and creating a pathway for the most enthusiastic and excited and reliable people to gain leadership, to get responsibility in a system. Um, and so um, rules are great. Rules are important. The most exciting action, where the action is for me, is in culture building, um, instilling norms, values. And so um, some of my most exciting conversations are with culture builders, community builders, community managers, uh, because um, that's the work. That's the work in making um, a democracy not a flaming um, uh, 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 a pile of crap. Um, uh, and, and, uh, and, and I don't know. There's good problems and bad problems. And so, yes, everyone's complaining about their governance, but when they're complaining about no one being involved, that's a, that's a problem that doesn't impress me when they're complaining about um, the users who are kind of too passionate and taking up too much space at meetings. Um, if there's more than one of them, then I'm impressed. Then I'm like, wow, you're doing community, right? Um, so that's a little bit of an answer to your question. So you just said something that really struck me about, it seemed to be a distinction between democracy and contribution uh, being di at least being different things. Obviously, they can democracy can involve contribution, but contribution is a different thing. And I think people mean contribution sometimes when they're talking about democracy, a, a sense that one has value, that one can contribute to something, um, even if one's level of contribution or one's vote doesn't count for more than a unit of one, um, uh, where others may be. 10 or 100 or or something like that i'm wondering if you could 
explore that a little more, it, 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 partly just to get people's definitions right, because I think people tend to think of democracy as as way approaches to voting. Mm. You know, rep, direct representative. Um, you know, representative in the sense that the U.S. has. You know, right. like the the uh, no uh, the, the electoral college, for example, a very indirect form of democracy. Yeah. And I think one that's deeply flawed, and I don't think we're being political in saying that. Um, the, uh, yeah, I mean, voting, in my uh, in my view, is neither necessary nor sufficient for democracy. Um, so I, I, th- I think you've got that right. There, there's kind of two things in there. Well, you know, so so I don't know which direction you're asking me to riff. One is okay. um, any you like. <laughs> okay, <laughs> great. <laughs> great. Uh, well. Um, to your first point, separating kind of contributor from governance. Um, this is another reason why it's so um, important to evade utopian questions is the governance system you, you, you start, you end up with um, is dependent on the govern on the system and the context you started. And you see it really clearly um, in open source projects, this conflating, which I think is a productive conflation um, of code contributors and sort of uh, political power. So uh, Python made a very intentional choice that core code contributors have a lot of political power. And I think that's smart. I think it's good design. I think it probably has downsides. Um, for example, it, uh, maybe it uh, undervalues um, other types of contribution of the project. Um, and um, maybe it asks, you know, political skills are different than code skills. So, uh, so you kind of, you know, can get yourself in trouble. But overall, it just makes a lot of sense because those are the people who have demonstrated care at the global level for the global project. So great, great. Uh, design, you know, uh, take advantage of that upside and then design for the downsides by providing um, how to run a meeting training for your code uh, for your code contributors by having extra uh, projects or pathways for other kinds of contributors to give. And so this is that path dependence in play. Well, we found great people. They don't have the right skills and they're not everybody who matters, but they make a lot of sense as a, as a first stab for our governance system. So uh, this kind of path dependent or evolutionary view of governance growth it, um, uh, really kind of drives it home that it's not about imposing or, or, or you know copy pasting one perfect governance system on every project. It's more about providing tools, capabilities for change and evolution over time You know, as a function of your own projects specific history so that's riffing off of the first kind of theme you offered um i uh and then on the second i can probably stop at what i how i started which is I, voting I, is neither I, necessary nor sufficient i i know i know simon has one in the waiting but right. i i had to look i thought i'm going to go back and look at the uh linux kernel mailing list to see if linus is still in charge and the only thing i see there is what he says to somebody Shut the f up! <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I, and, uh, I was very pleased to see last night Linus uh, testing a new Mastodon <laughs> account. There's a there's oh really? A, a, co- <laughs> yeah, there is the, the social dot opened yesterday, so we're going to see a oh a whole really new avenue. Yes, yes. That's uh, interesting. For, That's for interesting. At Linus at social dot that 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 account went live yesterday. Uh, so, we'll have to be. so, so what do you what, what's going to happen there? Do you think, Seth? Because you know, Mastodon is attempting to be a um, a, 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 a distributed um, uh, uh, emergent governance system. Is that going to work, or, or are we going to be overrun by um, uh, people who want to put up walls against every other server in the end? Um, both, right. I mean, yeah, you don't have to ask me. Uh, um, It's going to introduce more fragmentation in the media space, uh, um, which is going to be, um, which means the communities that do develop are going to um, uh, be more unique and be really good at specifically serving the people they serve. Um, And um, uh, it's going to be hard to find those. If if you're an outsider trying to find your way, and it's going to, you're going to struggle a bit. You know, yes, there's this federation component. Yes, they're linked to each other. Um, That's going to provide some tempering um, of this fragmentation kind of uh, tendency, um, you know, there's clear there's a clear upside to Twitter, right? Um, that it's it's the one place everyone's on, um, and there's clear downside to Twitter, and and uh, the same same with Mastodon. Sorry to be so evasive. 
But yeah. <laughs> no, I, I see a very clear downside to Twitter at the moment, which is why I've stopped using it. That's right. Um, that's right. I, I, I so, always try to. What, that's, a, that's a little bit of a, a mental hygiene. Uh, when yeah. I'm experiencing the downside of the system, I just try to remember uh, there's upsides to this. You know, shut the f up. Um, you know, very clear downsides to a strongly centralized um, uh, unitary um, governance, um, and the upsides are crystal clear. Um, you know, it doesn't struggle with roadmap. Uh, it doesn't struggle with direction, um, and it's become very successful. Uh, yeah. And so I'm I'm willing to you know uh, n- uh, nod at that. And it's a really important hygiene for me to always remember um, when I'm really facing only the upsides of a system. In the case of of Mastodon, um, uh, it's a its ability to filter effectively. Um, and build communities of practice, uh, what downsides are going to come with that? We have to get ahead of that. Otherwise, we're just going to be that pendulum swinging from one platform to another. Yeah. And so, the, I mean, the, the good thing about Mastodon mm-hmm. is that when I do decide that I'm tired of wherever I'm hanging out there, I can actually move and take my uh, social graph okay. with me, which is a thing I simply can't do on Facebook or, or Twitter. Mm-hmm. So, Beautiful. Uh, you know, the, I have the freedom to fork as a, as a, as a non-coder on Mastodon. But the question really to ask about Mastodon is um, when the governance that's going to emerge there is going to be one that's very much the expression of Lawrence Lessig's code is law approach to to governance. Uh, We're going to see what's encoded into the system set the rules much more than the the norms of the individuals who are using the system. Do, do, Do you agree with that? Or do you think that we're going to see um, the users find a way to take control? Well, I mean, to whatever extent that's true on Mastodon, it's more true on Twitter. Uh, so Mastodon is going to be a step in the right direction towards a, a normal social-based order, which I'm, which actually has huge downsides. Um, it can be super oppressive um, and uh, and difficult, but I'm generally a fan of moving that direction. So if there's hope of getting out of Coda's law um, into something more dynamic, where code is some of the law and norms are some of the law, I think Mastodon is really a step right in, in the right direction, and um, and I'm definitely watching closely and if i have anything um uh if i have any you know, um uh, uh lack of hope for it um and i'm overall hopeful for it um it's less on its design i think the design is wonderful and you know, very inspiring and it's great to have an open source foundation for social media i'm just a little you know i just don't know if it's going to capture those network effects um uh and and um you know if, if if our if our best hope for Mastodon isn't something Mastodon does, but you know Elon Musk continuing to mess up, uh, that that's not I wouldn't call that a strategy for growth. <laughs> but on the governance, I'm very excited. I'm very excited to provide governance tools to Mastodon instances and let them uh, turn into laboratories for governance for themselves. Are you hanging out on Mastodon somewhere? Can I can I follow you there? <laughs> Uh, you can see um, below my name. It still says um, at Twitter, right? Yeah. It looks kind of. It does look kind of Twitterish. What's what's down? Yeah, there? It does look <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm 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 overdue. I, I I am in two places on Mastodon, and I admit to still using Twitter more. Um, and uh, but I could see a I could see a um, some some kind of uh, moving over. But I, but I'm thinking too. Seth, we don't have much time left, but I, I want to get your thoughts on media fragmentation itself. I think part of what's going on is that the internet's eaten everything. And I mean, it, it is now, you know, we are living digital lives now that are far more interesting and complex than what they were 20, 30 years ago, or even 10 years ago. And, um, I was thinking, for example, in music, um, it used to be able to only produce music through a f- relatively few record companies and and consume it only through physical media um and now you can produce it anywhere i mean again you get a little dependent on a youtube or on a spotify but you you have an awful lot of there's enormous optionality in both production and consumption of music to the degree that um you know there's no common there's a less of a common anyway uh sense of what music you know what's popular music now it, it's very very fragmented so but there are communities within those those fragmentations and and they do cross pollinate to some degree i mean you know i was with a bunch of relatively older people at a at a country show uh a country music show recently because that's i'm in a small town 
you go to whatever's on <laughs> and then there's opera this weekend and then there's some country music and there's you can go to the country bar down the street and it seems to be a relatively safe and fun place so there is some cross pollination so i'm wondering and i don't know if this goes to your to your specialties or not but i'm sure you're paying attention to it um absolutely yeah it's a design decision right um there's a there's a quip i lean pretty hard on that i heard ages ago which is it's about photoshop photoshop made good design better and bad design worse uh, and I, I see this really as the general effect of technology when people are asking what's this change going to do um that you know you can uh, you can get pretty far by uh by leaning on that um uh, fragmentation as well uh fragmentation is going to make strong communities a lot stronger more effective and and and, and more um, influential and beneficial to their participants and it's going to make um, bad communities worse which is not just like null uh but it, um you know hurt people um and i think that's what we can look forward to um as uh media fragmentation increases uh whether that is um distributed social media or the democratization of a lot of um, uh, traditional gatekeeping tools, music, books, radio, podcasts, so on. Yeah, I, I'm I'm developing a a community myself. Sort of, um, I hate to say it's on Facebook, but it's in a group on Facebook where I never see any ads. But um, but it's entirely devoted to shooting pictures of radio transmitters that will be off the air in five years because radio is a dead medium walking right now. You know, a senator in the U.S. is trying to save AM radio and AM radio. There's nobody investing in it as nobody. The radio is all suck at playing it and the few that still have it. And but I but I sort of see communities growing around everything. That that one is a purely accidental one that just has to do with an old obsession of mine. I like to look at towers and antennas and I'm an old ham radio guy and I kind of like those things. And antennas are invisible now because they're working on frequencies that are so high that an antenna could fit in your hand, yeah. you know, or inside a clock and uh, nobody knows it's there. Um, and and I'm, I'm not sure where I'm going with this, except that it seems to me that, I, you know, human humans are social creatures. I mean, you study this, right? We're We're going to develop groups and we're going to govern them and civilization is doing that without violence i think would that be a, a, a summary statement of some kind i'm not sure if it is or not <laughs> um yeah if if we're wrapping it up um um uh providing opportunities for um for communities to be intentional about how they're structured um and to um, and to either you know um, change or or bail ship um, when they've learned their lesson, uh, whatever uh, hundreds of lessons that is, um, I think is really inspiring direction to go. And I've been really um, honored, lucky uh, to be able to push it. Well, that's great, and I think we're about out of time at this point. So we we always close with like three three questions. One is the first is the second is too brief to even mention right now, but. Um, but the first is, is there anything we haven't talked about you'd like us to have brought up? Oh, <laughs> uh, dozens of things. I, I could keep going all day. <laughs> I know I wanted to ask on Medigov. So maybe it was just a quick, a quick one on what Medigov does. Great. Um, uh, 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 Medigov, the Meta Governance Project, Medigov.org, is a research organization that I'm active in, bringing together um, uh, developers, uh, e-democracy advocates, uh, lawyers, media scholars, data scientists, um, uh, theoretical computer scientists. It's really a beautifully vibrant community that I'm very passionate about. Uh, that um, is interested in using online communities as laboratories for governance design and experimentation. Um, and so that's really the hub for activity around providing tools that um, any community can bring in um, uh, to experiment actively in how they run. Um, other organizations that I'm passionate or excited about while we're plugging? Oh, yeah, uh, um, this seems like the best for that community so far. Yeah, and that's at metagov.org. Um, and there are lots of things listed there along the outline. Um, so I advise people to take a look at that to know more about one of the many things Seth's involved in. So Seth, the, to, to close, what are your favorite text editor and scripting language? <laughs> I'm in Vim, uh, um, and I work actively between uh, Python and R. R um, uh, is such it's like fun it's fun to build figures it's fun to do stats now it's fun to do data munging in so i'll start off in python for kind of raw 
um, Munji glue everything together, maybe um, uh, um, uh, with a bridge to SQL, because that's also a lot of fun when you're above 10 million data points, um, but wrapping up in R, which I just have a lot of fun in, and, and all in, yeah, BIM. That's that is a longer answer than I expected. I love it. So <laughs> I think our I think our, uh, our our listeners and viewers will too. So Seth, thanks so much for being on the show. This has been a, a great hour, and we have a lot left over, and we'll have to have you back in a bit to see where things have gone. Wonderful. After some interval. Thanks for thanks being for here. Having me. And so Simon, you 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 learn a lot in this hour. Uh, yeah, uh, yes, I think so. Uh, and I've, I've also revisited a whole load of um, things that I haven't read for a long time because uh, it, it turns out, you know, I, I don't know the degree to which you, you knew, Doc, but I've written about a whole load of these things previously. About Yes, I do know. And be, be, between between yeah. seven and nine years ago. And, um, and so there's, there's lots of flashbacks coming back from uh, evaluating uh, the... Uh, some of my, my, my greatest failures in community design. Um, uh, you know, I, I could mention some of them uh, because they've ceased to exist. Uh, <laughs> I, others, uh, others live on, and so I probably shouldn't mention them. So uh, all, all fascinating stuff. Uh, all I wish is that Seth could give me the answers rather than just tell me what the questions were. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it's 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 all a project. I mean, that's that, that's what strikes me about every open source code base. If it's alive, it's a project, and uh, and it's not done. I mean, when I talked to Andrew Morton, who we haven't had on the show, maybe he's been on the show before I came along a few years ago, um, but he said, you know, his whole work is stamping out bugs. That's it. You know, he's a Linux kernel guy. Uh, I don't know if he's as active as he used to be, but he used to be a, a real alpha dude in the in the Linux community and, you know, and he said it would still be a project 200 years from now. He said it's most likely just likely code base to be going in 200 years than anything else he knew. So I think these things never end. So, so what do you want to plug this week? Uh, you know, I'm, 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 I have very few holes that need plugging at the moment, uh, doc. Um, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm we, still spending all of my time uh, dealing with the European Union's uh, Cyber Resilience Act and its consequences. And the main thing I'd like to ask is if there's anyone who is a member of a community uh, open source project in Europe who would like to provide me with a case study of the impact of the CRA on their community, then please get in touch. All the details are oh, uh, on the website or on the screen. But that's really the only thing I have to plug. Well, that's great. I, and I need to plug next week when we have uh, Levi Maya on. Uh, Levi is another friend, a um, uh, guy I know personally. He lives in Santa Barbara, where we are plugging everything right now. We're getting huge rains there, which is unusual. We have friends staying in our house, too, which needs plugging, <laughs> it turns out. They went there for the sunny Southern California thing, and it's not there. Uh, I think where Seth is, it's even, it's even rainier. Anyway, but he's coming up next week, and... Uh, I believe Sean Powers is going to be joining us for that. So come back for that. It's going to be really interesting uh, because he's a pilot and he's a hacker and he's involved in, and a filmmaker. He's involved in a lot of stuff. So that's coming up next week. And I will see you all then. Listeners of this program get an ad-free version if they're members of Club Twit. $7 a month gives you ad-free versions of all of our shows. Plus, membership in the Club Twit Discord, a great clubhouse for Twit listeners. And finally, the Twit Plus feed with shows like Stacy's Book Club, The Untitled Linux Show, The Giz Fizz, and more. Go to twit.tv slash club twit. And thanks for your support.